Okay, up next we have Akiba. He is based out of Japan and is active in the international hardware hacker community. He's a research affiliate with the MIT Media Lab and a design consultant to UNESCO. He is the founder of SafeCast, Tokyo Hackerspace, currently starting an experimental co-living agricultural hackerspace in the rural countryside outside of Japan called Hacker Farm. And he is starting a hackerspace in the Tibetan and Himchali community in Dharamsala, India, in the Himalayas. And he is strangely infatuated with stage and live performance technology. So he is here to show us Shenzhen in 30 minutes. So can we please welcome Akiba? Uh, 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 hi, everyone. Um, I'm Akiba, and I am going to try, once I figure out this microphone, um, I'm going to try and talk about Shenzhen in 30 minutes. Um, it's actually normally like a two-hour long, two long talk, so I'm going to try and condense it. So I might go a little bit fast. If I do, I'm sorry about that. Um, but there's been a lot of news about Shenzhen recently. Um, if you believe all the hype, then you think that it's all about um, futuristic robotic arms or massive factories or Hua Chong Bay. And uh, that's, that's true, but at the same time, it, they're just, those are all just part of a larger holistic infrastructure. So um, I want to give... I want to uh, at least show you guys a bit more depth about what's available in Shenzhen. So let's start with sourcing. Um, <clears throat> when I'm in Shenzhen, I, do two t I normally do two types of sourcing. So one of them is spot sourcing, where uh, I look for components for uh, a final assembly. So I'm an electrical engineer. So I look for, like, I generally purchase, do my purchasing out there for, like, resistors, capacitors, um, inductors, things like that. And, uh, and Shenzhen is really great for that kind of thing because, uh, like, a reel of capacitors, a 5,000-piece reel of capacitors, oh, sorry, a 5,000-piece reel of resistors out there is about a dollar fifty. So, like, uh, and a 5,000-piece reel of capacitor is about three dollars. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. So those kind of products, are, those kind of uh, products are commodity items, and they're called jelly beans, or uh, like a lot of us actually refer to them as cockroaches because they're everywhere. Um, Hua Chong Bay is the wholesale electronics market, and it's really, it's actually a great barometer for what kind of parts you can source locally. So, and the reason why is if you want to, if you can source parts locally in China, then that means that they're already in mass production, and that also means that um, they're at rock bottom prices. So, like in this picture, these are the uh, AZ1117 uh, voltage regulators. They're 3.3 volts. They're about three cents. Three cents to five cents, depending on who you buy from. Um, so they're the kind of regulators that you'd find in like the cheap ten-dollar TP-Link Wi-Fi routers, things like that. Um, there's a whole, there's actually a reason why the components are so cheap in the markets, and that's like a whole different talk because there's a lot of like interesting stuff that's kind of sketchy, but it's like fascinating. And so there's like a whole group of people that really love just like the oddball Chinese components. <clears throat> So the other type of sourcing I do out, out there is uh, product sourcing. And uh, product sourcing is when you, purchase, uh, when you purchase full products and you just resell them at a markup. And uh, I typically like to do this, uh, <clears throat> I typically like to do this uh, to bundle together with my original designs or uh, to, uh, to, if they're related to what I design, then, uh, I, then I can sell them in my web shop. And I also recommend a lot of other people to do that especially when, they have, uh, when they're just starting out and they don't have a lot of designs, then to source product, source-related products and sell them in Shenzhen. Uh, so, sell the source-related products and sell them on their web shop, and that would bolster their catalog. So uh, in this case, you see USB cables. They're about 10 cents to 50 cents a piece, and in Japan, then they'd sell for like a dollar, up to five dollars for like the nicer ones. <clears throat> so... Uh, this brings me to the wholesale markets, and the wholesale markets are amazing. There's all types of wholesale markets uh, um, within the Shenzhen, within, uh, and not just Shenzhen, but actually, um, more properly, it's the Pearl River Delta. So that's Shenzhen, Dongguan, and Guangzhou. So a lot of people already know about Hua Chang Bay. It's uh, the wholesale electronics market. It's gotten so much press recently that um, it's, and also because of the, the Communist Party's uh, interest in Shenzhen, then all the property prices around there have increased, and so all the, like, the component prices are also increasing to reflect this. 
So uh, what I like to do is actually go out further, so about an hour outside of downtown Shenzhen, there's a place called uh, the Dopu Industrial Electronics Market. And uh, out there then, uh, it's less touched by the property value surge, and so the commodity prices are still uh, relatively low. But they also have a lot of industrial electronics, so you'll see, uh, you can buy your steppers there, servos, uh, your ball screws. Basically, if you're like kind of an industrial electronics or, uh, or mechanical nerd, then uh, that's kind of the place to go. So uh, I think uh, if, if Nadia found out about this place, then she'd go, she'd go nuts. <clears throat> um, one of my favorite places is the Dauphin Oil Painting Village. Um, it's, it's, where I, it's one of the places I go when, I'm, uh, when I can't handle sourcing product anymore in Hua Chong Bay. So Hua Chong Bay is actually nasty. It's crowded. People are pushing you around. And the worst part is there's, like, everybody has bad BO. So uh, like, when I need to get away from that, then I go to the Oil Painting Village because when you walk in there, you're surrounded by art. And it's just... Uh, beautiful, stunning like, imagery, and like, there's uh, a lot of just like, really nice aesthetics. Um, it's all copy art, but uh, it's still art, and it's really nice to be surrounded by it. When you go there, you can actually get oil paintings. Like an, if you bring a picture, or uh, if you bring, like, say, a, uh, one of your illustrations, then you can, get, you can commission an oil painting of it, and it's about $16 for like, an A4-sized uh, oil painting. <clears throat> If you have a, if you bring your designs on a USB drive, then uh, you can actually go to one of the digital printers there and get it, uh, get a high high quality digital print on canvas, and uh, the high quality digital prints on canvas are about a dollar a piece. So a lot of people do these for keepsakes and souvenirs, but I also recommend uh, people if they have a graphic design projects on say Kickstarter or something that they can use these as a reward. And so like like. Uh, it's like maybe it's it costs them one dollar, but then you can a, you can actually it can a, it can be like a five to ten dollar uh, reward level. <clears throat> so this is the wholesale jewelry market in Guangzhou. Um, most of the world's precious stones actually go through this market, and uh, I'm I'm kind of into jewelry, so I really like uh, I really like learning more learning about it. I'm I'm mostly into jewelry for the uh, geolo geological significance, but um. Anyway, so you can see like bags of uh, precious stones here and like and buckets and these are all like this is rose quartz which is one one gemstone. So these are blue topaz and you can see the uh, you can see it in their rough form, slightly polished and finally when they're cut and faceted. And uh, and these are the faceted stones. These are uh, the rose quartz, blue topaz, amethyst, citrine. Um, I I really like it because when I walk through there, I feel like I'm on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disneyland when they go through the treasure area. Um, you can also get uh, custom rings made. So if you want to get your, if you want to get a custom ring just for yourself, or you want to get custom rings for, like, say, a product you want to do, like, say, you want to embed a chip inside a ring, then you can actually commission them to have it made. They'll create a wax mold, uh, wax uh, mold, a wax mold cast, and they'll actually cast it in silver or gold for you, or whatever metal you want to do. This is the. Uh, this is one of the many wholesale textile markets. Um, the textile markets are really interesting because. Like, me and my girlfriend, we now don't really buy clothes at stores. So we just eat, like, once or twice a year, we go to the wholesale textile markets, and we just have our clothes custom made. Um, and it costs about the same as it costs in a store. So this is, um, I was testing out getting rhinestone t-shirts made. So this, this is one of my rhinestone t-shirts. Um, and it was just, so this was the first time I've done rhinestone t-shirts. Um, it actually turned out pretty well. The cost of the t-shirt at the wholesale market is about $3, which is kind of high. But, um, and the cost of the rhinestones, the custom rhinestones, are another $3. So it's about $6 for rhinestone t-shirts. So like, next time I go, I'm probably going to get like, a whole bunch of them for everyone at Hacker Farm. Um, along with that, there's wholesale markets for kitchen supply, toys, photography, watches, um, leather, accessories. So there's just uh, wholesale markets for everything. And it's really fun trying to discover these wholesale markets. And if you have like a web shop or you're selling stuff, um, trying to source product from it and see like uh, what sells. Um, so before I get into manufacturing, then uh, I'd like to talk about customization. A lot of people don't really know, um, a lot of people don't really uh, think about customizing. They, like uh, when they think of Shenzhen, they go straight for the custom manufacturer. But customizing is uh, a, is, is, 
is a tool that's used quite often for uh, companies that don't want to take on the risk or burden or, uh, or time, like uh, a time hit, to manufacture their own products. And so what this is, is you use, uh, you use a factory's standard products and you just either, and you customize them with your own uh, specifications and then you private label them. So uh, earlier this year, I took a bunch of people from Hacker Farm for a Shenzhen tour. So basically, I'm trying to, I'm trying to show uh, there's a lot of designers out there. And so I'm trying to teach them about how you would use the resources in Shenzhen. One of them is the factory, like how you'd work with a factory. So um, we brought a bunch of the designers into the uh, sample room of a silicone rubber factory. So inside the sample room, then you can see like a bunch of the standard products that the um, factory has. And they'll also do custom products. If you do a custom product, then basically you have to get tooling made, which is a die. And so that die for silicone rubber would probably be from $1,000 to $2,000. If they have standard products that somehow fit your, uh, your, your design, or you can modify your design in order to use their standard products, then you don't need to pay for the die. And so you just pay a per unit charge. And then you can specify the color, you can specify the type of silicone uh, rubber, uh, and you can also get it either like silk screened with your name and artwork, or you can get it a uh, hot stamp embossed. Um, so this, like something like this, would save you like like a typical run of silicone rubber is probably like around a dollar a piece or something like that. So like if you do like a run of a thousand, that'd be a thousand dollars. So if you if you can save a thousand dollars on the tooling cost, then you then uh, basically you just save like fifty percent of the cost of your run. Um, this is this is a plastic in, this is a sample room at a plastic injection molding factory and uh, here they have a lot of different phone cases. Uh, this this injection molding factory uh, offers what's called in mold decoration. And so normally when you get plastic injection uh, molding, then uh, then you just have like just the, the plastic like it's black or white or just one color. In mold decoration means that you can actually add in a laminate into it and that would decorate the plastic. So uh, injection molds that offer in mold decoration typically go for about fifteen thousand dollars for like one of the for like one of these phone cases, but if the factory, if you just want to do phone cases and the factory has those as standard uh, as standard products, then you can use the uh, you can use the factory's mold and you just pay a per unit charge. So this would be uh, this would be the la like this is an example of the laminate for the in mold decoration, and uh, your main cost is going to be. Uh, uh, like a reel of a thousand, like a reel of a thousand shots of the laminate, and uh, <clears throat> so uh, and on those on that reel, then you can load in however many uh, designs that you want to do. So you can have ten designs, twenty designs, and then after you shoot them, like after you get the final product, then you'll have like you know you can have like a full catalog of designs of say your phone case, and uh, the cost of these phone cases, including the laminate, are about a dollar a piece. And in Japan, then normally they like for a nice. Uh, a nicely designed phone case goes for about twenty dollars. So if you go to like kiosks around the malls or something like that, you'll see them full of phone cases, and basically they take advantage of this technique. So this is just another example. It's um, it's a game controller that's also done with in mold decoration, and it's a standard product. So this is uh, this is the game controller mold, and you probably wouldn't want to get this done yourself if you just if you just want to make a couple of game controllers. And so this is the final product, and. Uh, it was three dollars from the factory, and at the retail store, it's uh, 85 euros, so about 100 dollars. So you can see like the kind of markups that you can get when you do customization. <clears throat> um, yeah, and so these are just uh, standard uh, USB enclosures. They don't include any memory, so uh, these are just the enclosures. They're about 25 cents. These are etched on both sides, so you can get them done with uh, your name, logo, artwork or whatever. And then after that, then you can just stuff however much memory you want. Typically, right now, the sweet spot is about 16 gigabytes, which costs 250, so about three dollars to get like um, small, like uh, personalized or customized promo items. Um, so I think a lot of people know about the prototyping services out in Shenzhen. It's pretty amazing, and like there's a reason. Like in Shenzhen, if you're just an individual, you wouldn't think about buying like a laser cutter or a CNC machine because you just go down the street and get that done. So. Um, but uh, so like it's a uh, so this is like one example is if you're gonna do a plastic if you're gonna do a plastic part then uh, before you shoot the plastic which would be like a ten to fifteen thousand uh, dollar investment 
then uh, you can get a vacuum cast mold for it, and then you can actually test the mechanical fit. These are about like 50 to $100, depending on who you talk to. Um, I don't really use that technique so much, so I use just uh, like SLA 3D printing. So like uh, my friends, uh, my friends offered, like you, there's so many 3D printing services out there, but I just go through my friends who, are, uh, who run Dirty SLA, so that's uh, Ian and Jin from Dangerous Prototypes. Woo -woo. And um, <clears throat> yeah, and so like for like $20, then you can actually have like a nice, like a fairly decent enclosure that you can take to a, a plastics factory and then start discussing with them. Um, you can also get custom uh, fiberglass and composite fabrication done, so they'll actually sculpt the material for you create the fiberglass mold, and then, um, yeah, and then just, yeah, you'll have that. So that's if you want to, like, build kayaks and things like that. Um, and everybody knows about the PCBs. You can get, like, the standard turn for a PCB in Shenzhen is about $3 for, like, the uh, ultra-cheap service. And if you get, like, a 24, you can get 24-hour turn also, and basically it's a real 24 hours, like, it comes the next day. Um, and uh, this is one of my favorite services. Like, uh, once you get the PCB, though, stuffing it is a pain in the ass. So you can actually get hand assembly there. It's about, it takes about 24 hours, and, uh, and uh, you just give them the PCBs and uh, the parts and your bomb. And then they'll basically start, uh, they'll, order, they'll order a stencil, which they get overnight service. And then the next day, they'll start uh, stuffing the board. And by the end of the next day, then you usually have your boards. So... Uh, and what I like about this service is that they do, they specialize in quantity, quantities from like one to five pieces. <clears throat> so you can get like, um, like uh, see the cost is about 1,000 RMB, which is about $160 for like five boards. So it's like $30 a board. But that's like, that's like time, you, uh, time you don't need to spend stuffing the board. Um, so these are actually Bunny Huang's uh, boards that ended up, that turned into the boards he brought to Burning Man like two, two years ago. So uh, this is probably what I get like the most questions on is like how do I get something made in Shenzhen or how do I get something manufactured? And I think like uh, I talked about different techniques of like say if you wanted to do some kind of business in international trade out there, but um, manufacturing is a fairly advanced technique. And so people, if you're new to it, then I'd recommend you go slowly because there's a lot of risk involved and um, well, yeah, it's, it's fairly advanced. There's a lot of risk involved. So wh what I recommend first is you always visit the factories that you're going to, uh, that you're even considering working with, and you always bring a physical sample. So it, even if that, like, so that sample could be a digitally printed book. So this is, uh, my girlfriend is a publisher, and uh, when she was looking for printers in Shenzhen, then uh, we went to visit five different uh, print factories. But before that, then we had uh, her book digitally printed and hardback bound, so it was hand bound, um, and it cost about twenty dollars to do that. We got three three samples, um, and then we took them to the factories. And the important thing about having a sample is once you have that, number one, you show the factory that you're serious, and that's that's what they're always trying to uh, figure out is if you're like really serious, and that will determine whether or not they're going to spend time with you. The second thing is they can give you like realistic price quotes, and finally. Uh, you get to, they'll bring in the production engineer to discuss how manufacturable your product is and, um, and like, uh, what, what are the, what other problems that you might have to, have, or what things you might have to change for it. So, uh, a couple years ago, then, uh, Bunny and I, we took a bunch of students from MIT Media Lab out to Shenzhen for our, uh, manufacturing boot camp. And so this is, we, they were all design students, but they didn't really have any industry experience. So we took them to an injection molding house, and we had uh, a couple of uh, uh, enclosure samples. And basically, uh, that means that, so at the injection molding factory, then the production engineer came out, and he, start, he just took a look at it and said, like, oh, these walls need to be reinforced. They're, gonna, they're too thin. Um, like, so he's like, I would add ribbing. I'd add venting for like, uh, and open up gaps here to, for cooling. Um, and also, like the draft angles were all wrong, and it would cost. And because of that, it would actually add more cost to the uh, the mold. And um, and if there are undercuts, then that adds a couple thousand dollars. Any, anyways, um, the important thing is like that's why you'd want to have a physical sample. And a lot of people are worried about doing plastic injection molding. Like they don't know enough about plastics or materials or whatever. And truthfully, you don't really need to know about that. That's like 
you, that's uh, when you go to the factory, the production engineer will handle all of that. You just need to go and you need to be able to communicate what you want to make to them. And that's probably the most important thing. <clears throat> um, so how do you find a good factory to work with? Um, normally, like ideally, you'd be kind of introduced to a factory. That's kind of how things work in China, but um, that'd be a warm introduction. However, uh, oh, that's why you'd also work with contract manufacturers, because normally they have, a, they have a long history of working with the factories that they deal with. And so those factories won't screw them over because they'd be messing up a relationship and also a customer that keeps on feeding them uh, clients. Um, let's see, uh, so this shot is a, this is a meeting with a, a contract manufacturer called AQS. Um, they're like probably one of my favorite people out there. They work a lot with small and medium size uh, 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 manufacturers, but or, or people that want to make things, and especially Kickstarter projects. But they're very selective, or they're they're actually much more selective these days. They've gotten burned by a couple of uh, uh, Kickstarters, or people that did Kickstarters. Um, so another thing is when you start doing when you start manufacturing, um, then like you'll you'll find that you'll also start going. They'll start inviting you out to dinner, and they'll start and they'll want to drink with you and drink like really nasty hard stuff. And that's kind of the business culture. Uh, my recommendation for that is if you don't want to drink, then don't drink. I used to drink a lot, and I used to try and be as social as possible. Now I don't really care because um, I, I'll, I'll work with the factory. Like I'll be nice to them, and like you know. And I, I always look at the long term when I work with factories, so uh, they'll eventually find out that. You know, like I that I don't need to drink in order to be cool. <laughs> so, um, so what if you can't get access to a uh, contract manufacturer? So, like my favorite are like kind of the small and medium size uh, people, like the small and medium volume uh, manufacturing done by kind of indie developers. And I think th that's like really the where the interesting stuff comes out. But if you can't, but that doesn't really fit in with contract manufacturers. And so, if you do that, then I recommend. Like, uh, you go to Alibaba and find as many factories as you can that do what you want. If there's too many factories, then, um, then cut, out the ones, cut out the ones that haven't been in business for too long, and then take that list and uh, contact all those factories and ask them for a quote. Generally, I ask for a sample quote of two to 10 pieces, and then 100, 500, and 1,000 pieces. But that really kind of depends on what you want to make. So from that list, then uh, you get like uh, maybe whittle it down to about five different factories, contact them and tell them you want a factory visit. Any factory that doesn't give you a factory visit, then you should just cross them off your list immediately. Like you don't want to work with them. That either means they're too busy to see you, uh, they're ashamed of their factory, or they don't have a factory. So in either case, in any of those cases, that's a problem. Um, so uh, yeah, and then after that then make a, Make, schedule a trip and go visit, go visit the factories. So I don't recommend you do this. This is my girlfriend when I took her to uh, the, the print factories and she, she started climbing on top of the offset printing machines to see how they worked. Uh, luckily, I, I was good friends with the, uh, the factory owner. So. Um, so my final thing I want to talk about is logistics and fulfillment. So logistics is kind of like the forgotten son of manufacturing. So everybody wants to do, pull the trigger on like the 10,000 piece production run, you know, and then like, and run around and scramble and get the 10,000 pieces all finished and boxed up. But then after that, you have to remember that you have to get that, get those boxes across the ocean. And that's where logistics comes in. And it's actually a really difficult problem. In fact, I think for people that have been manufacturing a while, logistics scares, like, scares them more than the actual manufacturing run. So, uh, um, so I'll start small. Uh, when, I, when I first bring people out to Shenzhen, I open an account with them with a shipping agent. Um, so this would be a shipping agent in Huachang Bay. And when you open an account with them, this is for like kind of small time things, and uh, you just, they'll open up a box, and you have a box. Whenever you uh, go and buy stuff, then you can take it and just throw it into the box, and then, and then they'll keep the box open for about a week. So whenever you're ready, then they'll close up the box, close up your account, and then they'll ship it. And generally, when you ship with these kind of shipping agents, then they'll, they'll use Express, uh, like FedEx or DHL. And uh, it's basically $10 a kilogram. But if you hit 21 kilograms, then there's, like a, there's a hard wall where it just drops to $5 per kilogram. So like, um, there's a lot of times when like, we'll ha like, I'll have like 18 kilograms of stuff that I'm trying to ship out. And it's about $200. Um, 
And so like I need another three kilograms. So you just like throw, throw stones and bricks into it until you get that. And once it hits 21 kilograms, then it drops down to $100. So it's a, it's a pro tip. <clears throat> so when you, when, you start, when you need to start uh, shipping bigger things, then, uh, then you, have to start shipping, you have to start thinking about freight. And so this is air freight. Air freight kind of sucks. I don't recommend, um, unless you really need to, unless you have a, an emergency, like air freight, like this is a 250 kilograms and 1.6 cubic meters. So that's about one, one pallet. One pallet that's 1.6 meters high, so that would that pretty much fit on a four-ton truck. So it's about $2,500 for that, and so like you have weight limits and also volume limits. Whereas, um, so if you ship sea freight, sea freight, um, you basic this is for a standard 40-foot shipping container from Hong Kong to Los Angeles, then uh, it's the weight is essentially unlimited, and it costs about $1,500. So, um, and you just, and you get a huge amount of volume to ship things. In fact, you probably wouldn't be able to fit, a f uh, fully fit things into a 40 foot shipping container, uh, unless you're doing like just huge, huge things. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, but if you're gonna do sea freight, I recommend you work with a company that deals with logistics because uh, what you wanna do is, uh, because you'd want door to door service. When you do sea freight, then a lot of times you have to, uh, 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 sorry, lost my train of thought. So when you when you uh, when you work with Sea Freight, then uh, then you have to deal also with renting the shipping container and also uh, uh, getting things through customs. And a lot of times you have to like you have you have to bribe officials and things like that. So if you work with a door-to-door -door, uh, logistics company, then they'll handle all of that and also like trucking to the final destination. Um, another thing that I, that's really interesting and this fascinated me for a while is how like you get free shipping on eBay for products that were like under a dollar so because like normally like just shipping internationally from China to anywhere in the world from China to uh, from the US to China would cost like six dollars or something like that and so uh, it took me a while to find out but first of all if you notice the cost like uh, the low end of the costs are all about 74 cents and when I punch that into an exchange rate calculator, that amounts to exactly five RMB. And uh, five RMB is the cost, the starting cost to ship anything from China to anywhere in the world. Um, and the reason that exists is because there was a, in 2010, there was a trilateral shipping agreement between eBay, China Post, and the worldwide, the global uh, postal service, and including uh, U the US postal, post office, which is that, um, like products, it's only one way, products from China out into uh, the global postal service with a tracking number will get special rates. And this is called e-packet. But this is only, it was limited to eBay only. And so what this started was a cottage industry of shipping agents that would figure out ways to get around this. So if you look at it, then um, you can see that the e-packet service is actually cheaper. Like, uh, so if I, if I wanted to ship like a 50 gram package from uh, to here, like from, it would be cheaper for me to ship a 50 gram package from China to here than it would be from San Francisco to here. So that's like kind of what blew me away, is that, uh, that you can actually ship cheaper from China into the US or into Australia than, from, than domestically. Um, and this was, this was like, and, and basically this is all politics. <clears throat> so, but what that, op what, what that means is it becomes interesting to start doing fulfillment directly out of China. And so rather than dealing with the logistics, so you get your product made and then you have it shipped by sea or by airplane all the way across the ocean into, into the US, then now then it actually makes more sense from a business standpoint, it makes more sense to actually have your products uh, shipped, uh, uh, trucked from the factory directly to the fulfillment warehouse and then, uh, and then have them ship it uh, and break it down and ship it individually to uh, users uh, around the world. So like uh, this is 4PX, which is one of the larger fulfillment houses. You can see that it starts at 60 cents per, uh, like 48 cents plus 12 cents per piece. So 60 cents per, uh, per unit or per package. And then, uh, and then each additional piece inside the uh, delivery is an additional 12 cents. So that's like super cheap. If you use like Amazon fulfillment, then it costs about uh, four dollars per costs about four dollars per package. So once you have your uh, once you have your shipment at the fulfillment warehouse, then what you do is you just choose uh, how you want it shipped. And so like uh, like 
in China, they do so much shipping volume that you can, you can have your choice of any shipper. So there's UPS, DHL, FedEx. Um, there's a lot like SF Express, and there's a lot that you probably haven't heard of. And then you can also get uh, like Swiss Post, Hong Kong, po uh, Hong Kong Post, Deutsche Post, Royal, Royal British Airmail, and uh, so just all kinds of, all kinds of uh, shipping options. So that's just kind of, uh, that's kind of a quick whirlwind tour of Shenzhen. I have uh, 88 seconds left, yes. Um, so like what now? I think uh, so right now, like every time I go to Shenzhen, then it's like a huge dude fest, um, and it really pisses off my girlfriend. And from next year, then she's going to start running uh, Shenzhen tours uh, for women, and I'll be helping out with that. So I think that hopefully that'll uh, improve the diversity out there. Um, also, like I think it's interesting to start. It'd be interesting to start introducing humanitarian and aid agencies to the infrastructure out there, because if you can imagine, it costs about. One dollar to do a 200-page paperback book, like black and white paperback book, it costs one dollar in, in runs of 500 pieces. And so 500 paperback books, if they were textbooks, would, would probably fill 17 uh, classrooms of 30 kids. So seven, like $500 to give textbooks to 17 classrooms. Like that can not only be used for uh, developing countries, but also like in the US in inner city classes or, you know, just Anywhere, so I think there's a lot of potential if you understand how things work out there. Um, so hopefully I didn't go too fast. I'll be outside to get for Q and A if you have questions. And uh, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. <laughs>